Good morning. It's uh, Larry Brock, MP for Branford Brant, uh, here at the Branford uh, Police Services Station. I'm joined with uh, two distinguished guests. We have Chief Robert Davis and we have Constable Jeremy Morton, who is the president of the Branford Police Association. Thank you, gentlemen, for agreeing to talk to me today. You're welcome. Ms. It's no small secret that we have a real significant dangerous problem. I'm going to highlight that word, dangerous problem, in our criminal justice system. And we've heard phrases such as catch and release. We've heard phrases such as an unequal justice system. I've even heard phrases saying it's no longer justice. It's simply a legal system. As you both gentlemen know, I come to this position fairly new as a politician, but previous to that, I had 30 years of legal experience, uh, 18 of which uh, as a Crown Attorney here in Brantford Brant. One of the concerns that I had, particularly in the area of bail, is this whole concept of our inability to keep violent repeat offenders in custody where they belong to promote a sense of community safety and protection uh, for the victim. So we have, we have seen and we have heard tragic circumstances surrounding this jurisdiction. We have seen and heard tragic circumstances around this country, all of which stemming from individuals in all of our collective minds who should have been behind bars, in custody, awaiting trial, but we're all on some form of bail. We've also received recent uh, communications from local press that has highlighted, rather surprisingly to me now as a politician, maybe not surprising to you two gentlemen, where Brantford, our city of Brantford, stands uh, provincially and nationally in terms of our homicide rates, which, if I recall the, the quotes accurately, placed us sixth nationally in terms of our uh, population size with respect to the number of ongoing homicides a real concerning statistic. We've also uh, received uh, most recent uh, correspondence and press uh, from our local, one of our local judges in the Ontario Court of Justice, who is specifically calling on our local Crown Office to seek higher sentences for gun crime. We all know that gun crime has seen a substantial increase over a number of years. And I don't want this to be partisan, but this is one partisan little point I want to add, that under the leadership of our current Prime Minister, significant crime has increased substantially since 2015. So much so that uh, one of our local judges, in addition to calling out for increased penalties for gun crime, actually opined that gun crime in this country, in this community, is an epidemic. And these are dangerous concepts and dangerous terms. So I also want to, uh, to get your thoughts, uh, particularly Chief, you're the first person I'll be asking questions to, get your thoughts <coughs> with respect to the most recent um, uh, joint uh, letter prepared by all of the premiers across this country, as well as the territories, directed towards the Prime Minister, specifically calling out for changes to our bail system as it relates to gun offenses. I'm sure you've had an opportunity of reading that particular letter, uh, whether or not it causes the current government to react as quickly and, and appropriately remains to be seen. But at some point during this discussion, I wanna share with you some of the ideas that I have, that I have shared with colleagues, where we are working towards improving and strengthening our bail regime under the criminal code. And I'd like to get your thoughts on that. So I'm gonna open things up to, to you, Chief Rob Davis. If you could just elaborate how the concepts I've just presented to you is impacting your police service and our community here in Brantford. Sure, uh, I'll start with the letter that if one accepts that our, our elected premiers and their respective MPPs or MLAs, uh, depending on the term used in their respective provinces, are united coast to coast on this issue, irrespective of their political parties, that should be a signal that the average Canadian has had enough, uh, that 
that there needs to be a change to the bail system. You're right, you've provided the, the, the local events uh, very close to home here, as well as what we've seen in Ontario and the tragedy in BC are just examples of, of the, the need for this to be a serious issue that has to change. At the operational level, it's disheartening. Throughout the entire organization, from the constable right to myself as the chief, we're dealing with people that are consistently being, we're doing our job, we're catching people, we're putting them before the courts, asking that they be held in custody, and they're being released. And without a mechanism, a formal mechanism, a robust mechanism to ensure bail compliance, it doesn't work. And I would suggest that a lot of the offenses for which bail is being granted uh, is, is not reasonable. They're dangerous offenders, not the per se dangerous offender designation, but there are people that are dangerous to the public because of the types of crimes they've committed, yet they're right, revolving door. We're doing our job. We get them in. We've had incidents where, op where uh, people we brought into custody are so brazen, they're telling us the op telling the officers they'll be home before the officer is, and they're going to have to commit twice as much crime to get to where they were when we when we intervened. You know that that's that's tall tale sign when we have that level of brazenness amongst our criminal. And entities. I can cite that's a great point, Chief. And I can cite numerous examples in my previous career where I've actually read a Crown bail brief and long before I see that individual in bail court, they've already telegraphed to the arresting officer that they have no intention of abiding by conditions. They have no intention of staying away from certain individuals. And the proof is in the pudding, and we often see that. I've, I've had numerous cases where a person could be released at 12 noon and rearrested again at quarter after 12 because they've already violated a term of non-contact with respect to one of the witnesses or the victim. So I have been frustrated in my previous career simply in the, the amount of trust that our bail system is predicated upon. It's a trust based on a simple question from a justice to an accused. Will you abide by these conditions, yes or no? Well, of course, we know they're gonna say yes. We know that they're not truthful. The proof is in the pudding. Now, I don't want to disparage the entire process because I'm a firm believer that we live in one of the greatest countries in the world, that we, we are supposed to strike the appropriate balance between enforcement and restraint. We have the criminal code. We also have the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the most important right being the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty, a concept that I hold near and dear to my heart. But it's a concept that needs to be examined based on the individual circumstances of the offender. And just briefly, I want to indicate why I left the Crown Attorney's Office to embark on a career as a politician. I felt that the criminal justice system pendulum had shifted too far to the right in terms of giving all of the attention to the accused while sacrificing the protection to the community and the protection to the victim. All of this as a result of significant changes to the criminal code, as a result of key significant Supreme Court of Canada decisions that created this new presumption of release, that release must be the default and Chief, you certainly know about that because you've certainly received direction. And in terms of your overall approach with the rank and file officers, you look at numerous opportunities to release individuals internally long before they get to the criminal justice system. We're not talking about those individuals. We're not talking about individuals who do not pose a risk to a victim or a risk to the community. We are talking about these violent individuals who have a history of repeated violence of a similar nature or a repetition of that type of offense. And I might add, most importantly, a history of breaching court orders, whether they be bail orders, whether they be probation orders, whether they be weapon <clears throat> prohibition orders, case in point, the individual who recently killed the OPP officer, that in my view was a completely avoidable incident. If the system had worked with the appropriate tools, 
that officer would be alive today. Uh, so I wanted to add to that, and I share your concerns, uh, Chief, with respect to what you are seeing day in and day out right now within the criminal justice system. I just want to add, Larry, sorry for the interruption. You, know, you touched on something that's very important that the, the general population has to understand is the police service, you're right, uh, there, are, there are mechanisms for diversion, there are mechanisms for considerations that when we put someone uh, to the bail process, it is typically because they are the ones that warrant to be there. They're repeat offenders, the type of crime is violent in nature, but we also, you know, as an organization, uh, as policing in general in this province, uh, we do recognize that individuals uh, make mistakes and that, you know, for that first time offender, that low threshold offense, we have to be open to the idea of diversion, uh, suspended sentences, you know, glad do considerations, but those cannot be a carte blanche statement for all criminals, especially those that are using firearms, using violence, repeat offenders that terrorize communities. And that's the thing is I think of my career in sort of three, I've been in policing for over 30 years. And if I were to divide it into thirds, the first third, I'm not sure where we were at. The second third was a lot of work put towards the rights of victims and building the trust in the police so that when a victim came to us, they would have a level of security that if they came forward and the perpetrator was uh, put into the justice system, the victim had a level of security, peace of mind. And then it's just dramatically shift to where it appears that the criminal's rights have now superseded the rights of the victims in entire neighborhoods. We have entire neighborhoods uh, that you know, one or two bad apples will terrorize a neighborhood. And it's the, that repeat violent offender that right. should have been held for bail, should be held for bail, and they're not. Which is probably an excellent segue to turn now to the Brantford Police Association President, Constable Jeremy Morton. You've heard the chief comment on the situation here locally, which is no different, quite frankly, let's be honest with each other, no different than every community across this country. What is this doing to the morale of the rank and file that you represent? So for the morale for the officers that I represent, um, it's disheartening. Um, it's difficult to go out day in and day out to arrest the same people over and over. Uh, they are often told that I'll be home before you're home. Um, officers are working extended hours to try to keep their communities safe. Um, it's also the victims as well. Um, it's very disheartening for them to see the same individual that was out terrorizing a neighborhood um, back out on the street after they've been a victim of a crime uh, and wondering why this person is back out stealing property or um, causing more havoc in the neighborhood again. <clears throat> Which brings up another another concern that I have, and, and hopefully this is not going to be organic to this country, but you know, the country of America, you know, <laughs> snores or, or moves and, and we feel the impact. Uh, we know what's happening down there in terms of just a complete lack of trust and respect to law enforcement. You have protesters out there trying to lobby their city government, to state government, federal government to completely defund the police. But when they need police officers, they're the first to raise their hand saying they love the police. So you can't have it both ways. Do you feel that this overall general malaise and distrust and lack of respect for the badge, is it a problem here locally? Is it a problem nationally in Canada? I, I think it's both a problem nationally and locally. Uh, on a national level, um, policing used to be a career that was respected. Uh, they were leaders in the community, um, often had the opportunity to train uh, young students within the school programs. Um, we recently have been advised that we will not be continuing with our school resource officer program. Uh, it's currently been suspended. Um, it gave the police an opportunity to interact with younger members of society during positive interactions. Uh, it's not very often that officers have an opportunity to kind of mold young children uh, into becoming potentially future police officers. And by removing them from the schools, you're taking away a lot of that positive interaction that the students would have had to understand that um, policing is a good career, uh, it's respected, 
and that it kind of takes away that the police are only coming in to arrest or charge my parent kind of situation. Have you been made privy to any statistics, any data that suggests that what is happening uh, across this country where police officers are, are being targeted simply because they have a badge? We can all cite numerous examples of serious bodily harm, if not death to officers simply wearing a badge. Is that impacting, <coughs> excuse me, is that impacting the recruitment of future officers? Is there a fear? Is there a concern? I also heard some disturbing trends that a lot of the seasoned officers who would normally be on the street providing leadership to the younger recruits are now so concerned about their ability to return to their families that they're actually seeking office jobs within the service. Is that a concern here in this station or locally or sorry nationally? I can't speak on a national level. Uh, for the local level, um, we are a very young service. Um, we definitely have opportunities for mentorship uh, within our service. We, I wouldn't say are having a recruiting issue, uh, but I can imagine that uh, it is at the forefront of what people are thinking when they're applying for these positions uh, that you know, you can solely be targeted based off of the uniform that you're wearing, not the interactions or not the type of person that you are when you're dealing with somebody. And it's definitely at the forefront of the family members uh, who have a son or a daughter that are applying to uh, work in this profession. Uh, it's definitely a concern for them uh, knowing that they could be targeted just solely off of the uniform that they're wearing. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, now turning back to the chief, we, we've talked about the problem. We don't need to belabor the problem. We all agree that it's a problem. Let's talk about solutions. I referenced very early on uh, in this uh, video that uh, you've been made privy. I've read the letter from the premiers uh, to the prime minister seeking a specific change to bail law. But in that letter itself, they specifically make reference to a section 95 offense use of a, a loaded firearm in the commission of an offense. And they specifically wanted to make that a reverse onus uh, provision. And I don't want to make this to be a treatise on how bail works. We all understand reverse onus and crown onus situations. But my concern when I read that letter immediately <clears throat> was, well, let's go back to the criminal code and take a look at 515 Section 515 requirements where there is a reverse onus. And as you well know, it already specifies that use of a gun creates a reverse onus situation. So in my view, I may be wrong on this, but I'd like to get your feedback, Chief. Specifically identifying a Section 95 offense, do you think that is missing the target? I do. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. Is, is it you reference, it's already in the criminal code, so we know it's there, it exists. The other thing is if you look at the violence that's happening across Canada, you're also seeing a lot of knife violence, edged weapon violence, and so my concern is that if we hone into specifically firearms, uh, we may paint ourselves into a corner for other types of weapons that can be eaten equally as catastrophic for communities and individuals. Uh, so I agree with you that it, it already exists, but I think we need to be cautious to not just we have to look beyond weapons, uh, such as firearms, and consider as weapons that can be... Right. So I'm going to put the ball back into your court. Okay? If you had uh, the ability to take a look at a crystal ball and have the ability to speak directly to the federal government as an experienced police chief, what do you think you could offer by way of some concrete changes to the criminal code, whether it be the bail provisions, whether it be strengthening the sentencing provisions for gun offenses, which we all know has been significantly impacted by Bill C-5, which could be a, a topic unto itself, a future video perhaps. But what would you offer as, a, as some, some, some solutions to deal with these issues? First of all, is that do not spin the narrative that this is going to be a cookie cutter, one size fits all. Uh, the provisions in the judiciary and the criminal code allow for the consideration of the facts case by case. And so that's one is that allow the crowns or the crown attorneys 
and uh, the judge is to consider those facts case by case and look at the severity of it. Was there a weapon used? Uh, you touched on Bill C-5, like the when looking at offenses that can become house arrest, uh, that's, not, that's not a deterrent. And when we look at sentencing as well as with bail, we can never lose sight of the fact that the criminal code states that when we do bail provisions or we look at incarceration, especially I'm going to focus on bail, that it should not bring the justice system into disrepute. And I would suggest what we're doing right now, uh, at least what we're seeing uh, locally, regionally, provincially, and perhaps nationally, is we're bringing the justice system into disrepute. And my worst fear is that if society loses faith in the justice, then we may wind up in a situation where citizens are going to decide to take things into their own hands. Vigilante justice. Yes, sir. Right? I could not agree more. That is an excellent uh, observations, Chief. Um, what you just described legally is known as the ter one of the one of the areas of the tertiary grounds that a judge could consider in terms of weighing release versus detention, and uh, I don't think it's used enough, in my view, by crown attorneys, particularly in the area of gun crimes and serious knife offenses, because that ultimate test is how serious is the offense, uh, what are the circumstances by which you present this particular case? Is it a strong crown case? Is there a substantial likelihood of a significant sentence? So that's the first three points. And the last point, to your point, is would this particular release offend the conscience of the public or bring the administration of justice into disrepute? And quite frankly, what community is seeing right now with this revolving door justice that is coming day in and day out out of the Ontario Court of Justice, where you have overbooked courtrooms, you have overbooked justices of the peace, you have crown attorneys with dozens and dozens upon cases with a precious amount of time. Sometimes you have to make judgment calls that may or may not be appropriate in the circumstances. So one of the things that I would like to see is a multi-jurisdictional approach to this issue. To your point, one size does not fit all. One level of government is not entirely responsible for the mess that we find ourselves in or the solution. I think this comes from all three levels of government, federally, provincially, and municipally. I think the time has come that we take a look at specialized courts, sorry, specialized courts as it relates to serious offenses, gun crimes, weapon offenses. I know that some of the politicians in the Toronto area are bantering around that topic. We already have specialized courses, sorry, courts as it relates to drugs, mental health. As we know, we have the Indigenous Peoples Court. We have the ability to provide these special courts to deal with these extreme dangerous offenses. By allowing all the participants a more flexible approach of dealing with this, more time to deal with this, in my view, we're gonna get a more balanced decision from a judge or a justice of the peace that has the ability to assess everything, not being crammed in within a little bit of time. So that's something that I think the federal government needs to work with the province on because that is a provincial issue. Another issue that I want to get your feedback on is, I, I go back to the, 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 the circumstances surrounding the recent death of the OPP officer. And uh, one, one issue that's not really spoken at great length is the fact that he was wanted. There was a bench warrant for his arrest that was some four months old uh, before he committed uh, the death of the OPP officer. What is the current situation in terms of your ability as commander in chief of this police service to ensure that these fugitives are being caught on a timely basis or is it as the public believes it to be a simply wait and see approach if they ever commit a further offense then we do a CPEC check and we take a look, oh yeah, they're also wanted, and then we can arrest them on that outstanding warrant. What is the flavor, what is happening, and ways that we can improve that? I would suggest the latter that you described, is that if we have the event 
occur where we're having the interaction with an individual and we then run them on the national database CPIC, it's only then that we know that they're wanted. We may have the outlier events with people we're dealing with regularly because of the size of the city, size of the service. We may know they're wanted through internal communications, but bring in a fugitive from an outside jurisdiction, we wouldn't know that they're released here. And I've thought a lot about this, and, and, and not just with recent events, I've thought a lot about this over my career, is that people are released, quite often not required to remain in a jurisdiction, or you know, in our situation, someone could be, just as an example, released from Hamilton, out of a Hamilton offense, but decide to take residence in Brantford or vice versa. We don't know that. And so there needs to be some more robust mechanisms for tracking the, the violent offenders, uh, that if they are going to be released, and there needs to be a more robust entity that would be very focused on that bail compliance. Because all police services were stretched thin as is with the regular calls for service, and then we have people coming into our jurisdictions that we may not know are, are wanted. So I often wonder about this. Are we at a point where we need to have entities, uh, and I only use them as an example, but where you have the U.S. Marshals that, that monitor the movement of fugitives? Uh, are we to have an entity like the Alberta Sheriffs that could take on that role, possibly? So I, re I don't know the answer, Larry, but what's happening right now is what you described. If we have the happen to have an interaction with them on CPIC or somebody we know intimately because of the size of the service, we don't know who's wanted yeah. in the city. And, and therein lies the problem, because ultimately this is a resource issue. You're taxed as it is in terms of your ability to provide adequate protection and enforcement within this community. You can certainly do better, and to do better requires resources. You could be well served with additional police officers you could be well served by an actual enforcement uh, team of professionals who instead of simply going out on the streets, patrolling the streets as part of their regular duties, are actually tasked with the responsibility that when they leave this building, they are actually tracking down local individuals wanted for a myriad of offenses. But I have to interject there, Larry, that I think to your earlier point, it has to be multi-layered, federal, provincial, municipal because we have people committing offenses from various jurisdictions with various degrees of crime, if you will, and that for a coordinated approach, I don't think it's fair to the local jurisdiction to handle that exclusively. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a coordination and implementation of whatever that looks like at all three levels of government. And you're right, a resourcing issue, but it should, I don't think it should fall specifically on the local jurisdiction because it's a multi-jurisdictional issue. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to the president of the uh, Brantford Police Association. Any thoughts in terms of bail reform that you'd like to share with me? Yeah, so from the association aspect, uh, it's just it's extremely disheartening uh, for our officers to go out there every single day uh, to be dealing with these violent offenders, uh, understanding that a lot of the times they're going to be kept home from their families, preventing them from spending time with their families, because they're doing paperwork associated with trying to keep these people in custody and trying to relay the information the best that they can to the justice system to let them know why they shouldn't be released. And oftentimes they're back out on the street if they are held for bail um, the next day or potentially the day after. Uh, we've had our crime analysts do multiple research projects with many individuals within the city that are on five 10, 15 different forms of releases um, within the city and they get held for bail and just are released. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I, I'm mindful of the time. I really want to thank you for the opportunity of meeting with you today and discussing issues that are not only a concern to, to law enforcement, but a concern to our community, a concern to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. You've allowed me to reflect on what you said by way of some concrete solutions. I'm going to take that back to, uh, to my caucus. As I alluded to at the beginning of this discussion, I've already toyed around with the idea of some private member bills, all designed to strengthen the, the bail system, to hold these dangerous offenders accountable and to remove them from society pending trial, still striking that balance between protecting their constitutional rights and that of the community is going to be a challenge. But I think the climate is, is such right now that everyone wants to see change and we want to ensure that there is that appropriate balance 
and that justice system pendulum. So again, thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.